The God that we serve is a complex God. He's intricate, mysterious, hidden. There's truly nothing simple about him. His existence is far beyond anything the human mind can comprehend. The same is the truth of the written word of God, the Bible. It's an extremely dense and complex love letter that God wrote for humankind. And God expects us to uncover this mystery, which is the Bible. Solomon speaks about this in Proverbs 25 verse 2 and states that it is the glory of God to conceal a thing. And it is the honor of kings to search out a matter. God is a God that always conceals something, hides something, so that the true kings can find something. And there's no tale in the scripture that illustrates this better than the start of the Bible, the tale of the Garden of Eden. Now remember, this is an extremely complex and hidden tale. And when we read this chapter and watch this video, we need to leave all our previous theology and dogma behind and allow these words of God to truly change our mind. In the opening chapters of Genesis, we're introduced to a garden called the Garden of Eden. This is man's eternal home. But after the fall, man is exiled from this garden and is sentenced to live a life outside of the garden. The Bible starts with this tale of the garden because it is the true core of why we are on earth. But the Bible doesn't stop there. The Bible also ends with the garden in the form of the new Jerusalem in Revelations 21 and 22 in the last two chapters of the Bible. God restores our hope and gives us a new way back to enter this garden again, to enter our eternal home again, the home that we all lost. But why does a garden play this major role of importance throughout the scriptures? Because if the Bible starts with how you lost your garden and ends with how you enter your garden, this transition from outside to within must be the most important facet of our faith. This is what the Bible is all about. How do we enter the garden again? And specifically, what does this garden symbolize for us today? Welcome to Review, where we unravel the mysteries of the Bible. In Genesis 1 verse 27, God created man in his own image. This first man has two components. It is both male and female. And although they are two, they are truly only one. They are in perfect unity. In the previous episode of Review, we did an in-depth study of this first man created in Genesis 1 and came to the realization that this man isn't only a symbol of the later known Adam and Eve, it's a symbol of Jesus and his bride that is created in Genesis 1. Now listen to this. God gives this man whom he had formed a home in Genesis 2 verse 8. This home is called the Garden of Eden. The scripture reads that God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Now throughout our Christian theology, we believed that this garden of Eden is a physical garden, a garden that you can see with your eyes, with trees that you can touch and fruit that you can eat. But perhaps we missed the plot all along. The key to this is where the garden is planted. The scripture states that God planted the garden in the east. 
The garden is in the east. This word east is our hidden message. This east doesn't refer to a physical location on a world map somewhere close to Iran. No, the garden isn't there. This word east is the Hebrew word Ketma, which is the word in Hebrew for the word eternity or before time. This word east or then Ketma is a word that appears right through the Old Testament and is used to express a different spiritual realm far beyond this physical realm that we've grown familiar with. We read about this spiritual realm in Habakkuk 1 verse 12, where the scripture states that God is from everlasting. God is from the east. This word express who God is as an eternal God. In Deuteronomy 33 verse 27, Moses speaks and states that the eternal God is thy refuge. This word eternal is the word ketma or east. You can almost directly translate this to the God of the east is thy refuge. Now this is such an amazing thought. The fact that the garden is planted in the east. The garden is planted in eternity, therefore the garden must be eternal. This has some major implications and changes our entire theology of the Garden of Eden. Because when something is eternal, it is not visible. We read about this in Paul's words of 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18, where Paul states, while we not look at the things which are seen, but to the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The moment something is visible and physical, when you can see it with your eyes and touch it with your hands, it's mortal. It's bound to time. In time it will perish. But the moment something is invincible and not physical, then it is eternal. The same applies to the God that we serve. Timothy speaks about this in 1 Timothy 1 verse 17 and states that God is eternal, He is immortal, and He is invincible. These three words express each other. When something is eternal, per definition it means it cannot die, it won't perish, it is immortal. Therefore, it must be invincible. There's nothing physical or visible to God. He's not bound to time as we are. God is beyond time. Therefore, He is immortal and eternal. The same applies to the Garden of Eden, because the Garden is eternal. The Garden is planted in eternity. Therefore, the Garden must be invincible. It's not a physical place. The garden doesn't have physical trees that you can touch and fruit that you can eat of. The garden is in a spiritual realm and doesn't consist of anything seen. It is an invincible dwelling. The same applies to the man that God created and placed within the garden. Because if the garden is eternal and invincible, the same applies to the man. We read about this at the end of Genesis 3, Genesis 3 verse 22, where God makes this statement that if man eat of the fruit of the tree of life that stands in the middle of the garden, he will live forever. He will live in all eternity. So when man eat of this fruit of the tree of life, he will live forever. He's not bound to time as we are. He's not mortal. He is beyond time. He is eternal. Per definition, this means this man must be invincible. Just like the garden, this man is also not physical. It's not a physical human being as we are today. It is a spiritual man, an invincible man, an eternal man. Now let's breathe some life into our current understanding of the garden. 
The garden is man's eternal home. And the Bible unfolds our understanding of this garden by comparing and equating this home of ours with quite a few other dwellings throughout the scripture. The most important aspect of the garden must be the tree of life that stands in the middle of it. But this tree of life doesn't only appear in Eden. It also appears in three other dwellings throughout the scripture. And through this, we can compare and equate these different dwellings with each other. We read about this tree of life in Revelation 2 verse 7, where the scripture states that the tree stands in the middle of the paradise of God. So this is our second dwelling, the paradise of God. Then we read of the tree again in Revelation 22 in the tale of the new Jerusalem that we started this episode with. This tree stands in the middle of the street of the city on both sides of the river. So this is our third dwelling, the new Jerusalem that we know is a symbol of the heaven. And all of a sudden we have four different dwellings throughout the scripture that can be compared and equated with each other due to the fact that the tree of life stands in the middle of all of them. Oh man, the garden of Eden, the paradise of God, the new Jerusalem and the heaven isn't four different dwellings. They are all the same dwelling, a spiritual dwelling, an eternal dwelling. Now this is such an amazing thought and revelation, and it puts everything in perspective. When God created man, he gave him a home. But this home isn't just a garden. It is much more than that. It is the paradise. It is his heavens. It's man's eternal home. Yes, you heard it correctly. The heaven is also eternal. Paul speaks about this in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1 and explains that we all have a home not made with hands, a home eternal in the heavens. Now this has a dramatic impact on our theology regarding the heaven. And the same spiritual law that applies for the garden applies for the heaven. If the heaven is eternal, the heaven must be invincible. It's not a physical place. There's no streets of gold within the heavens that you can walk on. It is a spiritual dwelling of God, an invincible dwelling, an eternal dwelling. Now the Bible doesn't stop there when it comes to the tree of life, because the tree appears in one more dwelling. And this dwelling is the key that unlocks this entire revelation for us of the garden and the heavens. Proverbs 11 verse 30 states that the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. The tree of life and the garden of Eden isn't something very far from you in your distant future. Perhaps it's something within you. The fruit of your heart that you bring forth is a tree of life. So we can almost say that the remaining dwelling of the tree of life is you. The tree of life grows within you and brings forth much fruit. Now let me just say that again. Perhaps the garden and the tree of life is within you. This isn't far-fetched. The scripture speaks about it in Ecclesiastes 3.11. That states that God made everything beautiful in its time. He also set eternity in men's hearts. The International Standard Version Bible translates this verse quite accurately. It states that God made everything appropriate in its time and placed eternity within them. Now this is something Jesus speaks about in Luke 17 verse 21. Jesus states that the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom is never something outside of you. It is a place of intimacy within your heart. Now this is the most important aspect that needs to enlighten us. 
These four dwellings, the Garden of Eden, the Paradise, the New Jerusalem and the Heaven, isn't your future reward. These dwellings are not just dwellings that you will inherit and enter one day in your future when you physically die. No, the scripture gives us a total different impression and perspective. These are all dwellings within you. And you can enter them today. Now Jesus sums this revelation up quite beautifully. In John 17 verse 3, Jesus states, This is the eternal life. This is Ketma. This is the east. This is your garden. This is your heavens. To truly know God. The moment you have a personal relationship with God, where you hear His voice and obey it, the moment the intimacy between you and the Father grows, you inherit something, you inherit your promise, you enter your garden and even your heavens today. Thank you for your time. I will see you in the next episode. Goodbye.